morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are around this fine world. We're here with a special Wells of Live session. It's called the ICE Series. And I'm here with my co-host, Ram Barkai, the visionary and the founder of the International Ice Swimming Association, with another special guest, Dr. Otto Thanning, a renowned uh, cardiac thoracic surgeon, channel swimmer, and cold water swimmer. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. This is another special session of the Wows Alive series, and we're calling this the Ice Series. This is all about ice swimming, cold water, hypothermia, and all the exciting things that the International uh, Ice Swimming Association founder, Ram Barkai, and his colleague, Dr. Otto Thanning, a cardiac thoracic surgeon from Cape Town, will be our guests on the very first The Ice Series podcast. Welcome, Ram. Thank you. Good evening. Yeah. And Ram, you know, I've known you for a long time, and I continue to be shocked with everything that you do, both logistics, yourself as an athlete, and the vision and the operations you do for the ice swimming world. Can you give us a little bit of background of how you got to this point? I'll have to make it very short, but uh, for whatever reason, um, I found myself, I always loved water. For whatever reason, I found myself uh, being attracted to the cold and the cold water. I still do, actually. Um, not that it gets easier. And um, it was a, a domain that was considered as a domain of the med extreme, unique, etc. And I went in and swam and I thought it would be really nice to, to formalize it in a way that we will educate people, manage the risk and know what everyone does and how they do that. And, and, and we're still young and I think we have a long way to go. And yeah, I think... Yeah. Um, it's probably one of the uh, reason Otto is here. Uh, cold in Cape Town, cold water is very cold to our heart. Excuse the pun, you know. And uh, and it's something that if you're passionate about swimming in the ocean in Cape Town, you have to learn to deal with the cold. Otherwise, uh, you swim indoors. So Otto will probably tell us about this more. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Thanning, you're renowned both in the operating room as a cardiac thoracic surgeon who uh, trained early in your career under the very world-renowned uh, Chris, Dr. Chris Barnard. And, um, but you're also a marathon swimmer, a channel swimmer, a cold water swimmer, and most recently a uh, Robin Island <laughs> uh, swimmer. Again, congratulations. Could you give us a little bit of your background? I'll try and I'll try and make it as simple as possible. I think my love for swimming is a love for uh, looking after your health and looking after your body and also developing um, a whole number of things which I think can attribute to a long and successful life. Um, I, as a fairly young uh, person um, at university level, uh, was a relatively good uh, pool swimmer, uh, I'll call it a a sort of a state level, um, if you compare uh, so the, the, the standard uh, with the United States. Um, and only later in life, um, more in keeping with the fact that I moved from Johannesburg, where I qualified originally, uh, to go to Cape Town to work under, uh, under Chris Barnard. And I found that I just could not swim in the sea around Cape Town, simply because we'd always been swimming in relatively warm, competitive type water environments. And in the sea in Cape Town, the temperature is significantly lower than uh, what you find in, a, in a, say, a, a, an Olympic event or um, a normal type of um, pool swimming. The, the sea in Cape Town tends to be anything from 10 to 20 degrees centigrade. And I found I just could not swim in that. And then it became a a fairly important aspect of my life to try and study that and to be able to do so. And I did 
Um, and I managed to learn how to swim, and I believe it's something that is acquired as opposed to being inherent. Um, and as a background, I've been very fortunate to have swum along a number of significant swims, a lot of those in South Africa, English Channel, um, Gibraltar, and, and, and. And that's really rather ir irrelevant because what I was hoping just to speak about was uh, the dangers of cold water swimming and how one acclimatizes, come, uh, come acclimatizes to cold water. So I'll just go plunging on with it unless you want me to answer questions first. Otherwise, I'll ask the, answer the questions at the end. I know that Ram is a place, uh, has uh, put forward a few questions, which I'll be very delighted to try and, uh, 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 try and uh, answer. Yes. So we're talking, we're talking about... Uh, okay. Dr. Athene, what I'd like to do before we jump into your explanation, what happens to the human body during hypothermia, Ram, could you describe to us what do you feel as a human when you walk into the cold water? There's a lot of us who we don't uh, live in a place like Cape Town when the water temperature is so low or many people who are listening uh, swim in the pool or many actually don't even get in the water altogether. But you, as an ice swimmer, what do you actually feel when you walk into the water? Well, the water in Cape Town uh, is not ice water. So um, it, it is quite different when you swim in sub five or, or, or zero, sub zero to the water in Cape Town. Um, yet there is a similarity. Uh, I think when you start swimming at Temperatures of, uh, I'll probably call it a 12, 11 and below, um, it's starting to get quite similar because your time in the water is, you are aware that your time in the water is definitely limited. Obviously, some people can swim for a long time in 10, 11 degrees, uh, some people less. But when we go into water of 17, 18, especially with this little bit of sun on the back, um, you don't have that sensation or you, you swim and you feel like I can do this forever. Obviously my shoulders pack up at some stage, but not the cold. Um, the entry to the water is always a very tough one. And it took me a while to, to uh, understand it in the sense that uh, also if I say anything medically wrong, you'll have to correct me, but that the core body temperature at the end of the day doesn't matter how many ice baths or ice cream I do. Um, my core body temperature always get back to, to my normal core body temperature. So I don't become a polar bear just by swimming a lot in, in cold water. It's just that I know and my body knows how to handle it. So the entry to the water is always hard. Um, when we swim in Cape Town, uh, Kemp's Bay, usually, I know that the first five, seven minutes, I get in, I put my head down, and I swim slowly until I regulate my breathing and my body adjusts to the cold. And it's never easy. Sometimes it's very hard. And sometimes it's easier, but it's never easy. Um, for whatever reason, I kind of like that bite uh, that the cold uh, brings to my skin and my body. And, and I actually prefer the 12, 13 degrees to 15, 16, unless obviously you do a long swim, because at 12, 13, my skin kinds of go numb. Um, so I don't really feel the cold anymore. I actually feel quite nice. At some stage, I start to feel cold inside. And also we talk about this. And um, I think for me personally, it's a, it's a huge mental thing for me. If I come to get into the water and I really don't feel like getting into the cold, the water is... Uh, 11 degree can feel like minus one. And when I feel fit and acclimatized, um, I can jump into 11, 12 degrees and it feels absolutely fine. You know, I just jump in and swim. And after a few minutes, I feel very comfortable. 
And I know it is difficult for other people and it's very difficult for me um, to understand how difficult it is to other people. Um, I have seen people that obviously have a significant uh, bioprint, uh, which does act as a big advantage. Uh, there is no doubt in my mind. But when it comes to sub five degrees, uh, close to zero, the natural body fats start to, from what I've seen, start to act uh, less and less as an advantage. And I find myself as comfortable as some people with significantly body fat. Um, it's never easy. That's all I can say. It's never easy. Some people hate it. Uh, some people love it. Some people love and hate it, <laughs> which is probably the majority. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Thanin. So explain physiologically what is happening here. This, is, uh, this would be fascinating to learn. Fantastic. First of all, Stephen, my name is Otto. I have okay. been addressed in uh, an official way. And in terms of um, hypothermia and open water swimming, it's a huge subject. It's very important because open water swimming has become very popular, which means that the occurrence of hypothermia is increasing and its understanding and management becomes very vital. Um, there are two main differences to appreciate in understanding hypothermia in open water swimming. Um, the first is short exposure to extreme cold water. In other words, exposing yourself to sub-zero to five degrees centigrade. And as Ram uh, knows and has created the International um, Ice um, Federation or, 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 or uh, organization, uh, in order to be a member of this, you have to uh, swim at least, a, I think it's a kilometer or one and a half kilometers in under five degrees centigrade. And I consider the exposure to extreme cold water completely different to prolonged exposure, which is the second of the two, uh, to less cold water of anything from 10 to 18 degrees centigrade. And the difference, um, I will try and elucidate. Now, there's some very crazy concepts with regard to swimming in this very cold water. This is not a Photoshop. This is a guy skating on a frozen lake. And there's a guy who climbed into the water from a hole, which is over here. I don't know if you can see the arrow. And he's swimming underneath the guy who's skating. And I consider that remarkable. It's amazing, but it falls into the category of the first of the two uh, hypothermic situations that I mentioned. And this is another one which is very interesting. It's a, a Russian lady um, who specializes in having a group of people cut a hole in the ice in Siberia. Um, and then she swims with these beluga whales, and she does so completely naked. And I went through a huge number of pictures of her to try and get one that I thought would be appropriate to show um, because she is stock naked. But what is not on this picture is the fact that she has three people in a very thick um, um, anti-cold anti um, um, suits. They're heated and they've got uh, ancillary oxygen to give her or air to give her. So every now and then she indicates to them by waving her arms, they come forward and they give her air and she has a few breaths and then she continues swimming with her belugas. And that is remarkable. Um, she is swimming in water that is essentially very, uh, very, uh, very, uh, very close to zero. And the limit for this type of exposure, in my opinion, in anybody is about 20 minutes. And the recovery is in many hours. And it's that period which has significant dangers. And that's what I would like to just briefly go through or touch on. This is another example. It's uh, Lewis Pugh jumping off an ice shelf into uh, water, which is obviously very close to zero. And it takes a very special type of ability to do both of these types of, um, shall we say, expositions. And I will try and go through that again. Um, I think it's very important to, to, to realize that there's a major difference between controlled core temperatures in mammals as opposed to reptiles that do not control their temperature. Um, it's generally accepted 
that early life forms on Earth were initiated in the sea and creatures had very little control over their core temperatures. As land animals developed, there was a benefit to a regulated core temperature that allowed for further development of greater physical and brain activity. In other words, mammals developed more abilities than reptiles and were more successful. And what is interesting, I think, is that core temperatures in mammals vary significantly. Whales are very close to us, 33, sorry, 36 degrees centigrade. We're 37, cats and dogs are a bit higher. Goats are 39.5 and birds are up to 42. And those temperatures are regulated in those specific category of animals or humans. By regulated, I mean they aim to keep the temperature of their core at 30, 30, at, in the man at 37 degrees centigrade. And why do we do that? Why do we regulate that temperature and not be like reptiles who will adopt the temperature of their environment, which could be anything from zero up to something significant? And the reason for their regulation is that it confirms confers a very big advantage in refining metabolic functions and thus development. All our enzymes function optimally at 37 degrees, and the enzymes are the things that manage our internal environment in terms of our digestion, muscle function, liver function, kidney function, and everything. And this is the basis for the evolutionary dominance of mammals over, uh, over reptiles. It's also the basis for the massive complex neurological development that has happened in Homo sapiens. But it comes with a cost, and that cost is a very high energy need. So how do we regulate temperature? Um, because regulated core temperature confirms, uh, confers this massive advantage. Um, the central blood temperature is assessed by receptors in some of the major arterial vessels. Mm -hmm. This information is relayed to centers in the brain, in a part of the brain called the hypothal hypothalamus, and where the regulation me me methods to increase core temperature or to reduce it are started. Um, the mechanism is by regulating how much heat is lost or how much heat is gained. And there's this question I mentioned about core temperature up here. Core has also been spelled slightly differently, like C-O-R-E, like a core of an apple, which is the central part of an apple. In Latin, core, just spelled C-O-R, relates to cardiac or to the heart. And a very good point is to measure the temperature of the major blood vessels, in other words, those that are close to the heart. And that's the temperature that we regulate and keep at 37 degrees as mammalian humans. So what does it mean if we're not at 37 degrees? And as far as hypothermia is concerned, it's defined as anything less than 35 degrees centigrade. And that's again the core temperature, the COR temperature. It's mild if it's between 33 and 35. It's moderate if it's between 28 and 32 and it's severe if it's under 28. So what we're referring to, as I mentioned again, uh, is that the centrally maintained blood pressure is very important. And we try and keep our core temperature at 37. The big question is, how do we heat, uh, uh, arrange for heat to be lost or to be gained? Well, on land, we choose our environment, we wear appropriate clothing, and we regulate heat loss in a number of ways. We regulate our metabolism, and all these things are done automatically. But in water, things are different. In water, heat loss, and that's on the left-hand side of the slide, is mainly by conduction. Conduction means the transference of heat from one object to another. So we tend to lose heat in water by the loss of our heat directly from the skin to the water. And what is important, if you compare water to air, if you stand naked in the air, in water you lose uh, through, uh, by conduction 
20 times more uh, than you do in the air. We also lose heat by evaporation, by radiation and convention. Sorry, I'm going backwards. In terms of heat gain, that's on the other side of the equation, we gain heat mainly by metabolism. That means converting whatever we have as food in our body in the form of fat or carbohydrate into a function. And that function will generate heat, it'll generate movement, it'll, uh, it'll generate any form of enzyme function, brain function, kidney function, and so forth. In water, we don't you, uh, uh, we, we do uh, gain a bit of heat by radiation from the sun, and we do gain a bit of heat from feeds, but very little. So that's the balance between the heat loss and, and the heat gain in water. And the objective is to end with 37 degrees. And that's down there in the middle of the so-called balance. And this is in balance. Heat loss is mainly by conduction, which I mentioned in water. We also lose a little bit of heat in what's called insensitive loss by breathing out warm air from our body when we breathe. The heat gain side is mainly and almost exclusively metabolism, but warm drinks possibly, and possibly a bit of radiation from the sun if we're swimming in bright sunlight. But the big secret is the core temperature is 37. We keep it there, and if it's not 37, we're not well. If it goes above 37, 38 or 39, we are very sick, and it's usually as a result of some reaction to some form of disease. And if it goes below 37, we don't feel well, and we lock in the autonomic nervous system to try and bring that heat up, and it's very accurately um, normally controlled. So the, the system that actually does this is the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic means automatic. In other words, we don't think about it. We don't tell our bodies to get cold or hot inside. It happens. Um, because of its function uh, uh, in the brain. It's very reactive, the system. It's highly selective to keep the central temperature, temperature conserved. And it regulates blood flow away from areas where heat is being lost. In other words, skin circulation gets shut down if you're uh, being exposed to very cold. It increases heat production if necessary. And the center that controls this is in the hypothalamus, a part of the brain. And the whole system, which on the one side is getting information from the body, and then the other side is the things that the body is doing to fix it, is uh, through pathways that go in, in nerves that are called part of the autonomic nervous system. And that system can be trained. And that's the very, I think, significant aspect of this business of cold adaptation. In other words, we can train the ability to swim for long periods in cold water, not in very cold water, in cold water. It's not training to be cold. It is training to avoid becoming cold. And that's very fundamental. And if you think about it, it's very interesting. So if we want to push boundaries and we need to concentrate on training this inherent control system, by making it as quick as possible, in other words, respond very uh, sensitively. In other words, we have to concentrate on training the autonomic nervous system as much as we train the physical aspect of breathing, uh, muscle movement, and joint function in swimming. I believe it's very important always to be very well informed on what you are aiming to become, uh, how you're aiming to become cold ad adapted. And you must know what temperature your training in and how you are progressing. And this is beautiful because it explains what you have to do. You've got to feel the temperature as this guy is doing, because if you don't, that's what's going to happen. You're going to go home cold. The answer is to get in and just push. And that's the picture which tells more uh, about getting cold. Because look at the 
poor fingers of this guy getting into this water. He's reacting to the cold, but what he's really doing, he's just going to get in and push. This happens to be at Dover, and it's an attempt of getting into one of the training sessions. So how do we regulate this system of thermo management? And it's about managing how heat is lost, which is mainly from conduction, and how heat is generated by activity. That's all the autonomic nervous system is about. It's a very fundamental aspect of life in humans or in mammals. And it's a thing that is based in the brain, but its function is through every aspect of body um, in terms of how blood is flowing, where it flows to, and how we prevent getting cold. So what's the secret of cold water acclimatization? The secret is to train the autonomic nervous system to react very quickly. And we should train it on a regular basis. And we must increase the time of cold exposure and decrease the degree of cold gradually. And if we constantly expose ourselves to that acclimatization, we learn to make the autonomic nervous system react quickly and properly. So what are we objectively trying to do is to tra train the autonomic nervous system to re re reduce heat loss early and to train to have the autonomic nervous system increase the metabolic heat production early. And if you think of it in terms of how this happens, is that if you start to get cold because you've gone into cold water and the blood temperature starts to drop, by the time it reaches the brain is a period of time. And unless the brain reacts very rapidly, you're going to get cold fairly quickly. But if we train the system so that it becomes more reactive, quicker and more early, we are achieving what we are trying to do, and that is to become cold adapted. And there's this objective um, to have these heat conservation mechanisms to occur as quickly as possible and as flexibly as possible. And it's a very interesting idea. What we're trying to train is the reactivity of youth because young people tend to react very quickly and very significantly. Old people seem to get old and things get stiff and the reactions tend to be slow. So this is probably a very good way of training to age gracefully and well. So that's not the only reason we should be swimming in this cold water. And this is another example of what I'm trying to say. This is Lewis Pugh, who has become very world known for being able to swim in cold water dressed like that, which is uh, semi-naked or in just skins. And this is how we train. Ram, this is you doing the training. Um, this is prepar preparing a porter pool with crushed ice to get the temperature in that pool exactly what we pre want, you know, which what we have decided. You stick a few uh, spadefuls of, of um, ice into a porter pool, stir it around like a teacup with this big shovel, and we can end up with the temperature that is a particular figure. And that figure then gets used as an exposure for an individual. This was training Lewis Pugh for some of his work. And you can then slowly drop it on, on consecutive days by putting less um, ice into it. And that's how we did it with uh, this. We had him on a bungee attached to the wall, and he swam breaststroke in the water, which we started at around about 12, and we dropped it all the way down to about 6. And this is another way of doing it. And these are the ice guys who jump into and just sit in this. And um, I have questions about it, uh, but I certainly think it is one of the valuable ways of training for cold adaptation. And the whole point of doing this is to do it on a regular basis so that the body reacts to it because it's becoming a, a form of exercise or a form of expression. But this to me is uh, probably the most important um, 
indication of what I'm trying to tell. It's the only graph I'm going to throw at you guys. And I'm going to give you here on the y-axis the temperature, 37 being the normal uh, blood temperature or the inside temperature of the human being. And there's a period where we're not telling anybody what's going to happen to them. At this point, we're going to tell them they're going to get in, into cold water. And if it's a normal person, in other words, somebody who's not trained, his temperature will actually start to fall for the next 20 minutes in anxiety. But if you are really well trained, this is what's going to happen. You're actually going to get hot. And this was discovered in the training of Lewis Pugh. And he underwent this training in, in that uh, port -a pool system. And he had an indwelling internal thermometer done rectally, which wasn't exactly what he enjoyed doing. And he, the, the, the temperature was being relayed by um, a little aerial that he was um, fitted with on his back, teletelemetry. And that went to a computer of the young guys from the sports science uh, system um, school um, next door to the pool. So he would arrive, he would get his rectal uh, thermometer, we would watch the computers, and they would all start saying, yes, we're in the right place, because his temperature was 37. But then this happened when we told him when he was going to get in the water. It took only 20 minutes for his core temperature to go up to 38.5. Now, if anybody presented to me as a medical doctor looking after people who are either going to swim or do a, a running um, marathon and they had a temperature of 38.5, I would say you can't swim or run. You're in a most likely got a temperature like that because of a viral infection. And if you go and run a marathon or a major swim, you will do your body exceptional harm, which will damage you maybe permanently. And this is what we found with Lewis. Uh, in normal exposure to cold, 20 minutes before, during that time, he went up to 38 and a half, and he did it consecutively. The very first time we discussed at great length as to whether we should let him swim, we could find nothing wrong with him. Two of us took the decision, he got in the water and he swam perfectly well. And this is what happened to his temperature. It stayed up for quite a long time before it started to drop. And at the time that most normal people, um, excuse me, most normal people are swimming in the same situation or getting into the cold water, they've gone right down to 31 degrees within 30 minutes in that, in that port of pool. So he was benefited, first of all, by starting at a higher degree and going down at a slower rate, whereas the normal people were going down at a, at a very fast rate. In other words, he was very cold adapted, and he had this rather exceptional ability, which has now been found in other people, to actually become hyperthermic. In other words, he got a temperature before he got into the cold, which made his ability to last longer in very cold water. And this happens also in my opinion, into people who are not swimming in these extremely low temperatures, and they are then able to maintain a temperature around about here and swim for long times. I think that's really relevant. So how do we train to do this normally? And in Cape Town, we train in the cold Atlantic, and we're fortunate to have the Sea Point uh, Pavilion, which everybody in Cape Town knows. This is the actual swimming bath. On the left-hand side, this is the Atlantic, and this is Sea Point. This is a 50-meter pool. It's absolutely stunning. And in the early part of the year, uh, midsummer, January, it sits around about 24 degrees centigrade. And then from the March, as winter sets into us, it slowly drops down, but at a very slow rate. So it may go down by half a degree to a degree every three or four days. And right now it's down to about 15. And we're at, at the getting to the end of May. And it makes the perfect place to learn or to become cold adapted because you're getting regular exposure in temperatures that are slowly going down. 
So this, I think, is one of the great advantages and obviously the other place to go and swim is to go and swim in the actual sea. But remember, the sea temperature is really cold. It's not always frightfully cold, but it varies not as much as that swimming bath does. So the whole thing about is a long, cold exposure, and it's about training to conserve core temperature. It's maintaining our core temperature um, that needs to be an early physiological response. It means a very concerted effort to train the autonomic nervous system. And we should train the autonomic nervous system as intensely as we train the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system and the mus and muscle function. And open water needs a lot of things. It needs a mindset, it needs a good stroke, but the most important is this cold adaptation. And this type of exposure is very uh, unique in my opinion. It's a very specialized activity that relies more on the mental ability to tolerate pain, and the limit is measured on how long your core temperature can be maintained in safe levels. It's obviously short if you're doing it in very, very cold water, as low core temperatures are very dangerous. So to the ice swimmers, it's not a negative thing that I'm saying, their main um, ability to do what they do is that they can control the discomfort and the pain of getting into that really cold water. But they can't, in my opinion, and shouldn't sit in that water for longer than absolutely necessary. And if their core temperature is reaching those levels around about 33, it becomes very dangerous. Because if you take a person out with a core temperature of 33, there's an after uh, fall. And that after fall is the absorption of the very cold fluid in the tissues of the limbs, the skin, and the superficial body. And that core temperature will drop once you've taken a person out of that cold water, put them in a warm environment, cover them with blankets, and give them warm, uh, warm drinks. It'll, it'll continue for up to 20 minutes. So if you're down at 33, and you're gonna go down for another 20 minutes, you are in a very, very dangerous position. And what is the danger is the one organ that does not do well in those cold uh, levels is the heart. And what happens to the heart in those situations is uh, without warning, it suddenly changes its rhythm to a rhythm that does not maintain circulation. And unless something is done very rapidly, you will die. So that's the challenge of, of, of training for this type of, of uh, uh, swimming, uh, it's got very little to do with cold adaptation. Cold adaptation helps, but it has to do with a mindset. And I admire people who can get into that water who don't go through hell and don't scream their, their, life, their lives away. Eight, high, high, the higher reactivity of the autonomic nervous system is a, is a feature of youth. And with age, this diminishes and dulls and also is slower. So training the autonomic nervous system, in my opinion, is a very cruel anti-aging tool. So I'll go now, on, we've discussed the, the, the uh, way it's done and where it's done. The only last thing I want to just mention is something that I find exceptionally interesting. It's called psych. And I don't know if you've heard about it, but I'll try and make a very sm uh, uh, small um, explanation. Psych stands for, um, swimming-induced pulmonary edema. And this has only relatively re uh, recently been recognized. Um, and it happens in, as a, it happened as a result of deaths in the swimming phase of elite Ironman triathlons. It was initially considered as drowning, but this was difficult to define as it occurred in very fit athletes during the early part the first part of an event, which the whole event lasts about eight hours. So we're talking about Ironman. You swim first for 3.8 kilometers. Immediately, you get out and you get on a bike and you cycle for 180 kilometers. And then you get onto a running uh, circuit, and that is for a standard marathon. There's no break. You do it one after the other. And the top guys are winning that in about eight hours. It's one of the very few 
major um, athletic um, challenges which last that long. But what they found in the Ironman was that a number of people, and they were elite athletes, were dying in the swim. And that's unusual because that's the first event. But not only that, they died early. In other words, they died within the first 20 minutes. And that was difficult to explain. The postmortems that were done on these people uh, came up with an answer that they were all in pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema is a sign of heart um, abnormality. And what it was all about eventually when they got the idea was what was happening is that there was a tremendous mismatch between the circulation in the arterial system and the venous system. And I'll try and explain that very simply. If you look at the blood circulation in the middle, I don't know if you see the arrow, but this is the heart. There's a left side, which has got red blood. It's been through the lungs already. And it is circulating from the left heart through to the entire body. It goes through capillaries, it does its job, and then it's returned to its heart, to, to the heart, which is on the right side. It then goes through the pulmonary circuit where it gets oxygenated and the whole thing starts all over again. The left side of this picture is the venous side. The right is the arterial side. And it's interesting that the balance between the two has to be perfect. But normally, there's only about 30% of the entire blood volume in the arterial side, and the most of the blood is in the left, in the, in the venous side. That's normal. We don't have a pump to get blood back to the heart. We have a pump from the heart to the circulation. Blood gets back to the left, to the sorry, to the right heart where I'm pointing, simply by gravity and by the muscle action. And there are veins, all the veins, which is, uh, is the venous side, have, they, uh, have valves. And what happens to the people who have this problem is that, first of all, they train in the erect position. They either run or they cycle for most of their work or most of their challenge. Anybody who does a triathlon is mainly a runner or a, or a cyclist, or they're good at those two. They're usually not excellent swimmers. And they try and better, better their swimming by wearing a wetsuit. And a wetsuit gives you a certain amount of buoyancy, but what it also does, it gives you a greater amount of venous return. So if you take somebody who's used to being vertical, running or cycling, and you put him horizontal, he's going to have more return to the heart because the blood is following gravity. If you make him kick very hard, it's going to aggravate it. And if you put a wetsuit on it, it also helps the venous return. So there's a mismatch between how much blood is in the venous side and how much in the arterial side. And on the, on the arterial side, the heart rate is up because you're anxious. Your blood pressure is up because you're constricting your capillaries. And therefore, the left heart, the red one, cannot cope with this vast amount of blood and is returning to it, which is the blue one. And it accumulates in the lungs and it causes edema. It swells into the air sacs. And that's indistinguishable from drowning because that's, you drown if the water comes into your lung air sacs. If you drown, it comes from the water that you're swimming in but if it comes from your own body, you drown in pulmonary edema. And that's what SIP is about. And it's very real. They've had in the last five years um, about 20 to 30 uh, um, occurrences of death uh, as a result of this condition. And the solution, which they have now got, is to stop the beginning of the race as a mass departure. They give you... 20 people go off and go for about a minute, so about 30 seconds, and then another 20 go. So they're going out in waves. And that stops them doing this tremendous kicking and this tremendous push in the very first part of the, uh, of the event because they want to get out in front to the point of the first turn, which is a boy about a kilometer from the start. So this has been a very interesting experience because 
uh, it wasn't expected, that it was actually induced by the event rather than by something called drowning. And that's all I think I should really say about it, although there is a, uh, an addition to that. The, the site that I've been talking about is called acute site. There's a secondary kind, and that is a late site. And that happens usually about three hours long um, in an event where people are swimming for that length of time. And that results from a mismatch again of the circulation coupled by a decrease in their ventricular IR function as a result of hypothermia. People are getting cold and the heart doesn't work as well, especially the left ventricle. So the thing is similar, but it's of long duration. And um, Chloe McCandle um, developed this um, in the third leg of an attempt that she was going to do the channel uh, four times. In other words, uh, uh, there and back, there and back twice. And that happened to her. And the proof of it was a, a very clear X-ray and an entire um, concept that was recorded when she was admitted to hospital. So it's a very real thing and it's got problems. Both of these syndromes, um, the, 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 the treatment is quite complex, quite a, it's vital because if you manage to get to them before they uh, start with cardiac arrest, um, they can be um, managed and can be saved. And what it requires is intense vigilance and monitoring and early recognition. So this is something that falls on all of us. That's my story. Thank you very much for listening. Wow. Wow. I mean, I have, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to defer to Ram. Uh, and go ahead and ask some questions. I have a few um, later. Uh, interesting. Otto answered quite a few questions that, uh, that I had in mind. Uh, it was very nice to see some pictures of the pavilion. I actually just came from the pavilion before the swim. I didn't see you there, Otto, today. Uh, I actually came here for this. <laughs> Um, I think that there are two questions that uh, I wanted to ask you. Obviously, I am focusing on the eyes, but at the same time, most of the people that come to eye swimming uh, come from a swimming background in open water swimming in the various degrees of, uh, of madness. You know, some swim uh, 10 kilometer distances and some swim 100 kilometer distances, but we all come from a, from open water swimming, uh, cold water swimming into the ice. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to ask a question about uh, when you showed a picture of us sitting in the ice bath, yes. uh, um, which is very interesting because I also have some questions in my mind about the benefits of the ice bath. So what, what was the question you wanted to ask about the ice bath? No, I think it's more a statement. I mean, sitting in the ice bath is probably one of the ways of trying to get this adaptation going. Um, but in extreme cold water, um, the adaptation will help you by an adaptation. The, the early response to you're going to get cold and the way you respond. A non-trained person, the problem with them is that they have to really get quite cold first before they start putting in all the mechanisms to try and uh, prevent heat loss. Um, I mean, to give you an example, when the Titanic went down, which is over 100 years ago, um, the people fell in the water. They weren't expecting to be in the water. A lot of them had had a lot of that alcohol, and they died within eight minutes. And they died because of the acute shock of getting into the uh, severe cold. They hyperventilated, you know, they started gasping because that's an inherent uh, reflex. If you get uh, suddenly into cold or you suddenly can't stop gasping for air. You don't need the air, but it's a, a natural reflex. And those two together put your cardiovascular system into trouble and they died of fibrillation. Their hearts just stopped working. They uh, went into a rhythm that doesn't sustain the circulation. But doing 
uh, training for cold water by sitting in cold water and doing it regularly, you are accentuating the rate at which your body can react and prepare to try and conserve temperature. And therefore, my statement is more is it probably works, but I don't think it's as good as doing what I was talking about, a gradual decrease in temperature in a swimming bath like the pavilion, which is one of the reasons why the people who use that bath very significantly, the swimming bath, are more uh, likely to succeed in the uh, swimming, for example, the channel. And if you go through the list of South Africans who have success, successfully uh, swam the channel, the majority of them trained in that pool under those circumstances. That's what I really meant by it. I don't, I don't decry or I don't belittle at all the concept of, of, of training by sitting in a, uh, in a bar. I can tell you right now, I can't do that. I wouldn't even try. I'm too old for it. <laughs> and I admire it. But I think if you really want to do training for cold preparation, it should be done in swimming in a pool rather than sitting in the ice. I, I, I actually agree because I've done both. And mm. uh, I find sitting in an ice in cold water, um, it does train one element of the cold, specifically if you, because you go straight into yeah. sub five or close to zero, because that's what the, mm. uh, the guys provide us with. It's not an easy thing to start from 10 to six to four to two by any guys. The water gets, it's a very small bucket of water. So the water goes down quite quickly if you start piling ice into this. Yeah. Um, I personally found that it does help in terms of what you say, you know, that, that uh, maybe more pain adaptation mm. that comes with extreme cold water uh, rather than, because what we don't have, as you said, there are two things um, in managing the cold is one is the pain uh, and the other one is the metabolism, which we create energy. Yeah. And if I, so if look at myself, I'm a fairly skinny guy compared to a lot of ice swimmers. Um, and I, for me, I realized that the trick for me is that I always had a high metabolism and a very efficient metabolism. Uh -huh. And so when I got into cold water, sitting in an ice bath, that element uh, didn't come into play. And it's sometimes much harder for me to sit in an ice bath for 20 minutes and zero degrees than swim for 20, for 20 degrees because my metabolism is quite strong uh, and I generate heat um, as I go in the water and I can quite quickly get to a place where I'm comfortable, even if it's zero degree. Obviously, I can't stay there for too long, but um, yeah, sorry, Stephen. Yeah, no problem. I had a, uh, Otto, I had a question on the uh, anticipatory thermogenesis. I was wondering if you could go back to that slide. Um, and, and my fundamental question is, and I, I've seen Ram swim and Lewis swim and all these, all these swimmers, actually uh, Lynn Cox uh, lives uh, near me or I live near her. Yeah. And this, this concept of, uh, anticipatory thermogenesis. Is it a conscious effort or do you believe it's a conscious effort? In other words, does Lewis and, and Lynn and, and Ram, do they actually think of being warm and then that itself raises their body temperature or, or is this some kind of reptilian learned response? No, I, I think it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit like, um, the experiment with dogs. If you take a dog and ring a bell and then feed it and you keep doing that, and then you, after a while, just ring a bell, the dog will salivate. Got it. Um, and that's an ex a, a sort of a, a psychological experiment that's been done many, many years ago. And I think it's, it's that. It's um, association. You tell somebody you're going to get cold, we're going to put you in this cold situation. If you do it regularly enough, they will react in being told. 
In other words, it's a form of, of a reflex. And I had an experience which also highlighted that we used to do a lot of swims from um, Simonstown to Musenberg. And it used to be an organized swim. And then we stopped doing it because they, they, they were worried to see too many sharks, I think it was. But we all used to meet on the beach at the, at the station at Simonstown. And everybody got a little number put on their arms and uh, everybody got a little bit anxious. And uh, the idea was at a particular time we would swim. And I remember going to that and uh, one of my friends, we all meet each other before and you shake hands and you do all the right things and be polite. Somebody shook my hand uh, and we were like 10, 15 minutes from going away. And he looked at me and said, Otto, are you cheating? You've already been in the water. And I said, I actually haven't. And then I realized what he was feeling. My hands were like ice. My skin on my face was like ice. I was already in this anticipatory period. Um, I had started to heat concern. And if they had done a, uh, a rectal thermometer on me, which gratefully they didn't, they would probably have found it that I would also have been elevated and I would have been probably precluded from swimming at that stage because nobody knew about this. So I think the important thing is that it's a trainable thing, especially the reactivity, the rate at which you do so. Take somebody who's not cold adapted and put them in cold water, they get cold very rapidly, and it can be much more dangerous to, compared to somebody who has uh, got the ability to react quicker. And I think that's the bottom line. And going back to what Ram was saying, I fully agree, getting into that cold water I think what you're really training is your ability to accept the pain. Now, look, there are a lot of people I know when they get into the water for the first time on the Atlantic side in Clifton, they get in as far as their knees and they have such pain they've never had it before and they get out and they shake their head and say, how the hell do you get in there? And I was in that very situation when I very first tried. I could not get in that water. It was so painful. And the training that I did was this business of, protracted time or increasing time and, in, and decreasing temperature. And after a while, I could tolerate it because my mind said, I'm not going to die. I'm going to learn to do something for the future. And I learned, I think that's what I trained. I trained my ability, ability to tolerate discomfort. And I think that's what the uh, sitting in, in a, a water bath does. I admire you guys. I wish I could do it. I can't. <laughs> Excellent. And, and my second question actually has to do with uh, statements you both made. And one, um, uh, Ram mentioned the word bioprene or fat. Me. And, in his, and he said, you know, it, it helps above 10, 11, 12 degrees uh, yeah. Celsius. But when Ram and his colleagues who have more body fat than him, get down yeah. below five degrees Celsius, Ram stated that it was that advantage didn't appear to be the case. Then I remember talking with Lewis Pugh a while back and he said, muscle is a greater insulator than fat. So those two um, uh, things seem to be either consistent or inconsistent, depending on where you look. What, what, what is the right answer here? Stephen, I don't, I don't believe that muscle is a better insulator. First of all, we don't have that much of it. Okay. We have muscle quite a lot, but we have a hell of a lot more fat. And a person who is really good at cold water tends to be, I wouldn't call them obese, but they are well padded. And there's no doubt that that has got some thermal protection. I mean, what does a wetsuit do, an ordinary wetsuit? It's like a fat suit. That's what it does. The only difference is your fat is um, subjected to a circulation which is controlled, whether you like it or not, by the autonomic nervous system. But there's no doubt that people who are slightly with an increased body fat uh, percentage do better or easier to swim in cold water. Then it may not be better, but they can do it for longer. But a truly well-trained person who really is uh, very well um, cold adapted doesn't really need that fat. And the fat's not going to help that much to make you swim better. It's a little bit more buoyant than muscle and bone. 
but um, you know, if you really want to be able to swim well, you need muscle. Got it. Got it. So, okay. So, I mean, when I look at um, uh, Ram Barkai, um, uh, Henry Karma, uh, Louis Pugh, I mean, these, these are, well, um, these are, these are strong men. I would not yeah. call them overweight at all. And uh, so that was, that was a sort of a, uh, you know, if you've got these the greatest male ice swimmers, Peter Stoichev, I mean, these are very, very strong men. Um, nobody would call them overweight and, and yet they're doing all these things. So thank you very much for that, that answer. And then my last question actually has to do, and Ram, you have a abundance of, you have the world's best personal experiences with this is it's rewarming. And you were mentioning SIPE and where the, the venous flow overwhelms the, the arterial side of the, of the body. And in this fat, this idea of rewarming. So you, you're, you're in this water, this very cold water and you get out and, and the next few hours are that risky section. What should we do, Ram? What do you do practically? And Otto, what do we, what should we look for if we're a, a volunteer or an assistant uh, to someone who's doing ice swimming? What do we look for? What should be, we, we be aware of? That would be fascinating to learn. Do you want me to go ahead or, or, or Ram? Either one, Ram, Ram on the practical side, uh, Otto on the medical physiological side. I've got a question to Otto about this as well. So I'll start. Uh, I don't understand uh, the recovery and the rewarming from a scientific point of view very well. I thought I did. And then um, Professor Tipton said that uh, after drop uh, is not what it is. Um, and it's just a momentum of cooling down of the, cooling down has a momentum until it gets to equilibrium and go up. It's not circulation. So um, I, we are gonna ask him in, I think the third episode uh, about, about this, but, but I do have a lot of experience from personally and watching people and, um, I know that when you uh, recover and you're going through that rewarming and the process of after drop, um, there are a few things that happened to me and I'd be interested to, to hear Otto uh, uh, respond to that. Um, there's obviously a physical uh, element when you finish the swimming um, and you don't really, you feel nothing. You can walk on ice for, without anything for, for about a couple of minutes or before that after drop comes and it just hits you really hard. And um, it takes me about three minutes maybe. And what I make sure is as I get out quickly to get dry, put warm clothes on and get to a warm place that I feel safe and comfortable before it start hitting me. And again, it's it's very different if it hits you after um, Sunday hot chocolate swim, which is a sometimes a healthy shiver, to swimming a, a kilometer or a mile in zero degrees when it hits you really hard. Um, so that's for me. That's very important that I I'll calculate that period of time before my core temperatures start dropping and it drops quickly. So I'm safe and warm and I know I can manage it. Uh, the other thing that happens, um, which I've seen many times and experienced many times is what's happening in the brain auto when, when in the after drop, uh, we all go through, aside from the comf the cold, we all go through some kind of a, a very unpleasant, unpleasant trip, uh, almost like a semi out of the body experience, which if you've done it many times, you expect it, you wait for it, you almost kind of hold on to the, to the roller coaster handles, ride it, because you know you're going to come out, out of this if you're in safe environment in a few minutes or, or 10 minutes. But I'm very interested to understand what, why does it happen to us that um, 
that suddenly we feel that loss of control experience, not just cold and pain, like out of the body experience, which is for many is quite scary. I mean, I, I, I see it in people's eye that they kind of not sure where they are. It doesn't take long for, for and if you experience, it could be just a few minutes, but it's, it's a place that we go to before, I don't know, something gets to equilibrium. And when it gets there, um, when I uh, did some swim with an with a internal capsule of, of core body temperature, my core body temperature was around 33, 34 degrees uh, when I recovered. I was still very, very cold, but my brain was focused. I knew exactly where I was. I understood everything. My sense of humor came back. I was just very, very cold. So I'm throwing the microphone to Otto. <laughs> Look, it's it's quite a complex thing. This after this after fall of the temperature. If you look at it in terms of what are you measuring and what part of your human body is really cold and what is not as cold. Um, if you take somebody out of a cold environment who is hypothermic and allow them to warm up or artificially help them warm up, because going back to your uh, question, Stephen, what should you do? If you're getting a person who's really hypothermic, you've got to get them warm as quickly as possible by removing anything that's cold on them, like a cold costume or, a, or a, a whatever they were swimming in, and then get them covered in such a way that they're not losing heat from the surface of their body. And that's what a towel and a blanket does. Remember that the skin has started to lose its control if you're really hypothermic. Your ability to shut down various areas are starting not to work. And the other point about it is the, after, the, uh, the, the, the reason why the, the core temperature drops as an after, uh, after event is that as your circulation is still functioning, you are starting to take fluid from outside the uh, circulation back into the circulation as your efficiency increases. And the tissues are cold. So the whole body if you weigh 100 kilograms, your blood volume is probably only around about 10 kilos, probably less. It's, it's less than 10%. So the tissue fluid is got to heat up as well. And that's the, after, the afterfall because that slowly gets assimilated into the general circulation. And uh, it's a natural phenomenon. But remember that if you are really cold in the periphery, in your nerves, even in your brain, the brain doesn't function normal. Remember, I told you that we maintain the temperature of our core because it's functional best at 37 degrees. But if you're measuring the core temperature by a rectal thermometer or whatever means, and you're down to 33, that means you are significantly inappropriate in your ability to run your enzymes or to have a brain function or to have kidney function and so forth. And going back to, for example, not being able to feel, Louis Pugh had complete loss of sensation in his fingers for six months after one of his very cold experiences. Six months. He couldn't pick up anything with his fingers because he had lost sensation. And that's called neuropraxia. The nerves weren't severed. They weren't broken. They just couldn't function because they got so cold. And they recovered. That's remarkable. But the after the after fall shouldn't last too long, and it shouldn't go too low. And if it does, it means that you were colder than you thought you were. And remember that anything under 33, if your heart is 33, or it goes down lower, the danger is that it will stop functioning normally. Now, normal function you can see immediately by how it pumps, and you can see it on an ECG. But if it suddenly changes from a normal rhythm in other words, the sequence of events, the things that contract when the heart does a normal cardiac cycle. If it suddenly goes ab uh, into an, uh, an abnormal rhythm, that rhythm can be fatal. It's called usually ventricular fibrillation. And if you actually see the, the heart, um, it looks like a jelly, uh, a mass of jello that's been shaken. It's just quivering. It's not 
doing what it's supposed to do, and that is not to contract and eject blood. So to answer your question, what should you do if you find a person who is hypothermic? Lie them down, cover them up, and warm them in whatever way you can, something warm by mouth or something warm to lie next to them or to put on them, but not hot because that can hurt things. And uh, it's it's quite a major, a major problem. And I've seen a situation where somebody was profoundly hypothermic. They rushed into the water and fetched him, and then they picked him up, lifted him up. And the minute they picked him up, he, he lost consciousness completely. He was completely unconscious, and he fell down. As soon as he lay down for a while, he slowly recovered, and then they repeated the whole thing, and he lost consciousness again. Because by lifting him up, he had no circulation to his brain. By lying him down, he had some. So it's uh, to answer your question, what do you do with them? Lie them down, get rid of anything that's cold, warm them up in whatever way you can, but gently don't stick them in a hot bath. It mustn't be hot. It must be lukewarm. Thank you very there are, much. There are circumstances where people, uh, uh, where people in that situation have been put onto artificial circulatory uh, support to heat them up. Um, and that I have been involved in, I've seen it, and I, I, I think that's an extreme thing. And that, that sort of facility doesn't exist every or anywhere other than very special places. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. This has been a, uh, a wonderful uh, kickoff episode. I learned a tremendous amount, and uh, I continue to enjoy watching Ram, you swim in the cold, and Otto, you swimming all over the place. <laughs> Long may it be. Well done. Thank you. We, Thank we you. would like to swim all over the place, yeah, once they allow us to. Yeah. yeah.